I'll have each one of the panel members and we'll start right here with Sergeant Caulfield. Uh, just give a brief introduction about who you are and, and uh, how you got here. Am I on? Okay. Hi, I'm Staff Sergeant Elizabeth Caulfield. I work at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center in Wright-Patterson. It's in Ohio. Uh, I've been there about five years. Great. <laughs> I'm here representing Air Force District of Washington, MAGCOM. Um, it's a really a pleasure to be here to speak with you all. Uh, a little bit about my job, and an, I'm a signals analyst, and I've had the opportunity to deploy with my jet uh, reconnaissance aircrafts about four times now. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Technical Sergeant David Miller, and I'm the NCOIC of Personnel and Readiness for the uh, 48th Contracting Squadron. I don't know what to do with my hands, so <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm born now and raised in Columbus, Ohio, so uh, here we go, right, OH? Nice, nailed it, yeah, she's from Michigan, so she doesn't get it, but uh, anyways, uh, I'm stationed over at Lake and Heath, we've been there for about six years now, I live there with my wife, uh, who's a teacher at the intermediate school, uh, we love it there, we love to travel, we've been to over 30 different countries, it's been fantastic, so um, representing you safe EF Africa. Okay. How's it going, everybody? I'm uh, Staff Sergeant Wilson Gardner. I'm with the Air National Guard. Uh, I'm a radar effort wear systems technician uh, with engineering installation, and we, uh, we're the ones that install COM and turn it over to BaseCom for them to maintain. Uh, I've been able to support U.S. STRATCOM, U.S. AFSENT, and a few guard bases over in the uh, southeast. Morning, everybody. Staff Sergeant Patrick Schilling. I'm an explosive ordnance disposal technician. I'm stationed out at Hill Air Force Base. Uh, EOD school for about a year and a half, two year time frame, and then I've been out at Hill for four years. Uh, here representing the Air Force Material Command, and I've zero deployment so far, but a lot of great TDYs, so pass it off. Good morning, everybody. My name is Senior Master Sergeant Stockett. I'm a KC 10 Boom Operator Superintendent stationed at Travis Air Force Base, originally from El Paso, Texas, and I'm here representing Air Mobility Command. Good morning. I'm Senior Master Sergeant Melissa Beam. I'm here from Air Combat Command, and I'm stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. I'm a career 1-0, so I'm a, a classified CNN reporter, and my current job is the 1-0 AFS manager. I think I already said that. But um, anything that my career field is involved with, I have the pleasure of assisting and aiding and molding and making it better for the future. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Senior Master Sergeant Kit Liu, representing the Air Force Reserve Command. Uh, I am an engineering superintendent for the 433rd uh, Civil Engineer Squadron. Um, I have a total of 13 years active duty, reserve, and civilian service. Uh, so, I, as I mentioned, civilian service. Uh, so, we serve as I'm a traditional we service outside of the military. I also work as a civil engineer at the Air Force Personnel Center. I'm married with two kids uh, and super excited to be here today. Good morning, my name is Master Sergeant Joshua Matias. I am stationed at Edwards Air Force Base, the center of the uh, testing universe. Um, I have the privilege of being the flight chief for the control tower, uh, which is a fancy way of saying we get to watch airplanes literally fall out of the sky every day um, and put it back together so the field can have uh, real data. Um, I'm married to my wife, Vanessa, who typically travels with me, uh, but we've only been there three months. And so uh, she's at home trying to find a job while I'm here. Um, I represent Air Education and Training Command, although I am a part of Air Force Material Command now. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tech Sergeant Brett Laswell. I am uh, AC-130U, uh, Special Missions Evaluator. Uh, best cast platform out there, just saying. Uh, <laughs> I'm representing AFSOC, uh, Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, I've been doing this job now for about uh, seven years. Um, happy to be here. Uh, look forward to the questions. Good morning, I'm Senior Airman John Titano out of Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. I am a client systems technician with the 644th Combat Communications Squadron. Yeah. Yep, former flight commander out there, Captain, Captain David Jorgensen. So, he's one of the main reasons why I got here. Um, so what I do is I maintain uh, voice and client workstations on theater deployed, um, theater deployed networks. And yeah, happy to be here. All right, well, thank you. As you can see, we have a very diverse uh, slate of award winners that, again, they represent uh, the United States Air Force uh, for 2019. So I'll start us off with the first question, and this will be open to the entire panel. Hey, what is this experience of being selected as one of the 12 Outstanding Airmen of the Year for the United States Air Force? What has this experience taught you about yourself?
They said, since I have the mic, I have to speak. Um, so, Steve, what it's, what it's taught me specifically um, uh, is to focus on my character and my conduct. Um, I've been blue for the 15 years that I've been in, but I'm more blue now because everywhere I go, I represent the enlisted Total Force Airmen. And so uh, I'm proud to wear my AF hat. I'm proud to tell the Airmen story. I'm proud to represent the 2.3 thousand air traffic controllers um, across the entire force. And uh, my wife's even on board with it. And so it took me from a place of being in the shadow of being a proud Airman um, to now actually being a voice for the Airmen um, and trying to make a difference for the Airmen that come after. And so it just, it's given me a platform um, to be a voice for what I call the marginalized. So, so for me, uh, first, it's extremely humbling. I mean, you think about it, you know, we're 12 of roughly 500,000 enlisted airmen, uh, total force-wise. So when you look at that, I mean, that's an extremely small amount of people. I think one of the previous 12-way wires was talking to us when we were out in uh, D.C., <coughs> and I think there's only around like 900 or so of us um, that's been selected for this. So, I mean, uh, extremely humbling. I, I come from a very small town, uh, 3,000 in southern Illinois, and uh, things like this just don't happen, you know. So for me, uh, it's extremely humbling, and to be able to represent one AFSOC uh, and and the uh, the special missions aviators out there, who who's a, it's really hard to compete against when you guys got like CCT guys and, and PJs, guys who are out there, you know, in the suck and, and dealing with getting bullets thrown at them and and things like that. So it's a very competitive, but so to be able to compete against guys like that and and to win. Um, extremely humbling um, and proud. Um, I mean, I, I am for sure, you know, out there praising this. Like, hey, dude, uh, I never in, in my 13 years thought this is where I would be. Uh, so it just goes to show that, you know, you work hard and, and you bust your butt. You, you can make it places. It doesn't matter where you come from. And uh, as long as you, you do the right thing and, and you can get places uh, no matter what. So uh, just to piggyback off of what... Um, both Sergeant uh, Matisse uh, um, and what Brett had said. Um, I think the biggest thing for me that I've learned about all this is teamwork. Uh, I would, for myself, would not be here based off of, you know, if it was just me, if it was just me going in all this. Um, uh, Chief and uh, uh, General Goldfein both got to meet my supervisor back when we had the AFA. Um, I give so much credit to him. He was there for me the entire way. He was my mentor. He helped me get over every hurdle I had. Uh, my commander was always there to give me good pointers, good directions, be like, hey, you know, this is great what you're doing. He's like, but I think if you do it this way, it might help you and, you know, boost you this much more. So the biggest thing I think I've really learned out of everything throughout this past year and then so far through this experience is uh, definitely teamwork. So make sure you know you're looking to your left, your right, keep your eyes forward, but know that everyone else around you is who's helping propel, like propel you and push you further and keep you going and keep that mentor. So that's the, the biggest thing that I've learned so far. All right, anyone else? Okay, we'd like to open it up to the floor. Do you have any questions for our award winners? So uh, one of the things that I would say as future, future lieutenants, future officers, is that uh, don't be afraid to take risks to actually accomplish the mission. Don't be afraid that, you know, you might be, have some pushback, but there's always a chance that you can always go a little bit further. Uh, for example, I had a uh, lieutenant who was hesitant to make a move because she felt her leadership wouldn't really support her on it, but then once she took, took that step forward, and took that risk, she saw that they were actually more than, like, more, uh, more than willing to help her and get that mission accomplished. Um. Hello. So my biggest advice to all of you would be to keep an open mind. Um, when you graduate, you're not gonna know everything. 
So when you get to your squadron, it's going to be very intimidating. And you're so used to that structure of like when you're a senior, oh, I know everything, I know how everything works. But when you get assigned to your unit, it's going to be very difficult to let go of that. And you're not going to be the all-knowing. So when you get there, keep an open mind. Um, latch on to a good senior NCO that's going to teach you the ropes. It's going to help you grow as the officer that you need to be. Um, a lot of the times I see my LTs running around with like chickens with their heads cut off. And I love it. That is like my favorite moment. You're a brand new LT man. <laughs> I am looking for you. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> um, and that, that's because I know that you are going to be the commander's replacement at some point in time. And if I don't get to you before other people get to you, um, I am doing you a disservice. I need to help you grow, not only for you, but for my airmen. If you're walking around with your sleeves rolled up, with pens sticking out of your pockets and your flight suits unzipped, I am gonna be very disappointed in you because then that's what my airmen see and that's what my airmen want to be like. Um, and we all know that you know uniform infractions might be the littlest of things, but think about it when you're running a checklist. Think about it when you're starting engines. If you, don't, if you can't follow simple things, what makes me feel, or what makes me comfortable to know that you may not, or may skip a part of your checklist. Um, so that's just me being air crew and just keeping that in mind. So keep an open mind. You're gonna get corrected. You're gonna do mistakes, but that's, we all do that. Um, so yes, biggest advice, be open-minded. Good morning, everybody. Um, for me, my advice to you is to get to know your airmen. There's going to be issues that you're going to have to deal with, but sometimes you need to get to the root cause as to why there is an infraction, whether they're late or they're having financial struggles. So you have to have those hard conversations with them. At the same time, you have to maintain your standards and hold your airmen to those standards. In the end, they will appreciate you for it. Sergeant Caulfield, how about you? Do you have anything for us? Any advice for the lieutenants? Um, I think going along with us, what Sergeant Sockett was talking about, just, uh, you know, don't be afraid to say I don't know. I don't know all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm always learning on my job, and I just became a supervisor last year. It's been a really uh, enlightening experience. I've really learned, uh, learned to lean on my fellow NCOs as well as our uh, new lieutenants that we have. I don't think we have any uh, academy grads at, uh, in my office, but uh, with our two new lieutenants, uh, it's just been a process of, you know, answering their questions, being uh, available to them when they have questions, and um, really getting to know them, and they've, you know, done, done us the service of getting to know us, uh, you know, their airmen as well, and uh, they've been able to lead us better for it. Uh, just to kind of piggyback off of what uh, Sergeant Beam said, uh, you have to develop those empathic relationships with the individuals that you're going to be working with. Nobody's expecting you to be rock star right out of the gate, knowing everything about the mission, everything about your job. Far from it. But what you can be responsible for is getting to know those individuals, getting to know those specific airmen, knowing what makes them tick, knowing what motivates them, not only from an extrinsic uh, value, but also what motivates them from an intrinsic value. I tell this to everybody as much as I possibly can, but I truly believe that the number one thing a leader can do is listen to an individual and, and hear what they're having to say. You can, you can see it when like a lieutenant or a captain or, or a senior or anybody will come up to you, ask you how your day is going, not really pay attention, and then go right into asking you to do uh, task A, B, and C feels cold, you feel disconnected, and you don't really want to develop that relationship and follow that individual. But if you have somebody that comes to you, genuinely asks how you're doing, knows a little bit about you, about maybe your son or your daughter, or maybe your wife that's having a baby or somebody's in the hospital, and genuinely cares about that person, that's where that development is going to come from, and that's how leadership is formed, at least for me. All right, thank you. Nick, next question. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Second Class Rachel Smith for Cadet Squadron 8. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming out here today. We really appreciate that. And also to thank you for what you've done as far as choosing the enlistment path. This last summer, I had the privilege of going down to Nashville to watch some of the basic military training, and I have an even greater respect for what you have all gone through. 
But my question today is, how would you best optimize the talent in the Air Force, especially regarding the enlisted side? Because I know there's an abundance of talent within the Air Force, but it's not always the most widely used or uh, put into use in general. So if any of you all could speak to that, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm going to start off with that. Uh, so when, during my last deployment in uh, 2016 to 2017, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the French Air Force and to learn a little bit about how their enlisted workforce uh, is set up. Uh, to us, uh, our enlisted workforce is extremely powerful. We have a lot of leadership compared to maybe our foreign allies uh, versus what they utilize their enlisted workforce for. Uh, within our enlisted workforce, we have a lot of personnel that have bachelor degree, master degree, have a lot of technical expertise um, within our, our already built skill set. So what I would advise uh, our graduating class, our cadets, our future lieutenants, um, when you get to your installation, learn about what, your, what the capabilities of your airmen or your NCOs. Uh, from time to time, like myself, I'm a civil engineer by trade, uh, on my, thank you, uh, and on my last deployment, uh, working with a, a junior captain uh, on a two-person team doing airfield pavement evaluation downrange, uh, it was a total uh, teamwork uh, decision-making process on whether a piece of uh, pavement or one way is capable of landing or, or taking off an uh, uh, airframe. So uh, what I would ask is when you have to make some decision uh, making process, work with your senior NCO, work with your NCOs to try to gather some of their ideas and their inputs uh, to come to your own decision uh, when making that decision making process. So my recommendation would be across the board, uh, not just officer, enlisted as well, right? When we look at uh, talent management and, and placing our airmen in the best positions, our job is to develop our airmen. However, as time goes on and technology changes, our airmen are, are become, they're coming in smarter, right? So um, even looking at recruiting, how recruiting is trying to go in the direction of, let me intentionally place an airman or a, a recruit in a career field that they have experience with, right? So if you have an airman who comes to you who is smart in, in computers, it, it's everybody's advantage to put that airman in a position where they're working on something they're smart. That doesn't negate the fact that we still have to develop them intentionally, right? So initially it may look like I'm placing you somewhere where you're comfortable, but that is really so I can, I can get some buy-in from you. Once I have your buy-in and I can start beginning your vector, now I can intentionally put you in places where you're uncomfortable so you can grow. So my recommendation would be get to know your, your airmen, uh, enlisted in civilians, since uh, we have a large civilian population, and then intentionally place them in positions to capitalize on the skills they already have, and then intentionally place them in positions that force them to grow. All right, great question. Talent management, extremely important in our United States Air Force, so glad you're already con concerned about it. Next question. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, give a little context to this prior evening. Uh, Tech Sergeant Weapon Floater on the greatest cab aircraft from the A-10C. <laughs> 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 of course, I've been deployed with uh, my own crew on the aircraft, so my question is, So coming, coming from a special missions aviator uh, background, super high ops tempo, we're uh, one-to-one -one dwells for the longest time. And uh, uh, the biggest thing to, uh, I, I can say is, is being taken care of. So I came from maintenance as well. I was, a, I was an engine guy on B-52s and F-16s. Uh, and I had a, I've always had great supervision, uh, direct, direct supervision. And something that's always stuck with me since I had this supervisor, Ryan Shepard, uh, he told me, take care of your people, your iron will get in the air. And I've lived by that since that day. Uh, you're gonna bend over backwards. My supervision has bent over backwards for me uh, my, my entire career, especially here recently. Um, I have kids that live away from me, so I'm constantly traveling back and forth, taking leave, and 
there's never a question about it. They're like, hey, dude, I'll take your shift. I'll take your flight. I'll take your deployment. Um, it's taking care of your people, doing what you can for your younger airmen um, financially um, if they're struggling. You know, point them in those directions, uh, Air Force programs that they have out there, uh, you know, Falcon Loan or whatever. Uh, we had an airman come to us, you know, his, his grandparents had died and, uh, uh, or his grandpa had died, excuse me, and uh, he had just got off leave. Two days later, he finds out they passed away. He didn't have money. So we're like, dude, we have a, you know, we have an aerial gunner fund. You know, we throw in 20 bucks a month or whatever for whatever reasons, normally for going away, but we're like, hey, dude, take this money, go home, see your family, be with your family, you know. It's doing whatever it takes to, to help help your airmen within parameters, of course, but, uh, you know, always be that leader and, and supervisor who, who's willing to go that extra mile and, and bend over backwards and take care of you so you can get the job done. Airman Titano, you have anything? <laughs> um, I guess to add to that, um, yes, as a supervisor, definitely be getting to know um, your airmen on, on a very personal level. Try to figure out what makes them tick and then in some aspects, put them in situations to make them uncomfortable. So for myself, um, I was reclassed into this career field, so the Air Force actually like put me in a position to grow. And being in communications, if it's not something you've normally done, it is very challenging. I had failed the Security Plus exam once and then had to retake it a second time after spending like you know money out of pocket just to try to get the information to try to learn. But my supervisor really spent time with me on the day to day. We always did like not not really a feedback session per se, but every week you check in and then you make sure that I'm checking off like classes for, comple for completing my CCAF, and then just making sure that I was very current with the information to, to make sure I was situationally aware. Uh, so for me, uh, the, the biggest thing, I think, because I actually I just recently put on staff sergeant, um, so being a senior airman and being in my career field, uh, you, you don't really get the ability to lead that much just based off of you know, what our job is inherently. And my supervisor would constantly, when we were out on the range and we're disposing UXOs and we're, we're clearing grids with submunitions, they would see an opportunity for myself and when there was one other individual who were, we were a lot ahead of, like, of our peers based off of what our job performance was. And so they would allow us to be able, supervised of course, to clear certain grids or go out and do certain UXO recovery or uh, go and retrieve certain packages or on our VIP submissions where I was doing uh, support for President Trump, they would allow us to take lead on a certain mission. So my supervisor would just kind of place me in a position and allow me to grow on my own. And he would just take that step back and just watch. So I think it really, like as a supervisor, assess your troop and assess how they are as a, an individual and how they are job performance wise and give them that room to grow, take a step back and just get hands off for a second. And then of course, if they start going the wrong way, just kind of guide in. Like, hey, you know, come this way a little bit or however else to help them on the direction. So I think that's the biggest thing is just give them that room for growth and most of the time they'll take it and they'll run, so. All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I did that. Sir. Oh, no. Um, yeah, that's definitely a difficult question to be completely honest with you because your definition of bad leadership for everybody is going to be a little bit different, right? Um, so there are core values, there are guidelines, and I feel that if, in my opinion, if those leaders are measuring up to those uh, standards, then they're deviating from the standard. And hence, it's my responsibility and duty to have those conversations with, with that individual to help them get back on course or help them help me understand why it is I see or I have that perception of that individual. Uh, I've been in for 16 years and I will tell you that I've seen what good leadership looks like and I will tell you that I've seen what bad leadership looks like as well. But you need that. You need that to understand and to grow. You need to have both at one point in time in your career because if you've only had good leadership, 
that doesn't necessarily help you grow to the utmost of your ability. You, know, you need to see what that looks like. Um, so don't shy away from that person, but it is your job and your duty and your responsibility as an Air Force member to help that person um, get back on track or just have those simple conversations. Maybe it's a blind spot. Maybe they don't know that they are a bad leader. I feel like sometimes we talk around the problem and not to the problem, and, I, and that, needs to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. So you need to have that courage to be able to have those conversations with people that outrank you um, and, and let them know that, hey, sir, this is a perception because it's gonna come out in the deox eventually, you know, but why wait? <laughs> so, come on, so have those conversations uh, and, and, and don't be afraid to, to, to have that because at the end of the day, they, if they are who they are, they're gonna turn around and thank you for letting them know that they are missing the mark. To add on to that, let's say one of you are those bad leaders you have to be receptive to somebody coming up to you and trying to make you a better leader. Don't just shun them away. In my experiences, I've gone to captains and said, hey, we need to do this differently, and my input was not well received. Um, the individual was just stuck in their ways. So you just have to be receptive to somebody coming up to you and asking you to help you to make you better for the airmen. You know, I'll, I'll just say um, all of us to NCOs and, and you as young officers have a responsibility to do. I talked a little bit about it yesterday, uh, speaking truth to power. So when you have someone that you believe is a bad leader, you have a responsibility to provide them feedback. Now, whether they choose to listen or not, that's something totally different. And uh, also, like I mentioned yesterday, uh, make sure when you approach someone uh, that you perceive to be a bad leader, uh, that you're objective, that it's unemotional, you provide them the data, the facts, uh, that, and, and the way that, that you see it. And, uh, and then, uh, like, like she mentioned, when you're on the receiving end as a leader of feedback, be open and just listen. And sometimes uh, your only response should be to say, thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. But uh, not many specific examples, uh, but uh, I, I think the point is well taken that we all have a responsibility uh, to let our leaders know when things aren't going exactly the way we think they should. But great question. Yes, sir. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? Good. My man. So, yeah. <laughs> so I came back to the academy. I worked for the academy. I came back to the Miss Airman. But uh, when I did this for Air Force for three years, man, blood hatred, and the other guy, uh, I got asked a question about 500 times. How did you get to be, or how do I get to be an outstanding airman? I used to get all the time. Congratulations. All right, so, um, <laughs> good question. Uh, got to see another winner kind of here working at the academy. Um, so, I say for me, the biggest thing is that knowing your impact to the mission, because uh, it comes down to it. Part of it is knowing what you've contributed, and part of it is knowing to stay motivated. And the biggest part for me, that what got me here really was my leadership. I've been blessed and very fortunate to have mentors throughout my career keep me on path and knowing what I need to do and uh, where the bar is set to keep me on the right uh, pathway. So that's kind of my advice is to have the good mentorship and to know your impact to the mission. And that's kind of what kept me going to get me here. Hey, let me jump in while, while they think about this answer to frame, frame this question a little bit for you, how they literally got here. They were first elected as the NCO of the year or airman of the year for their squadron. Then for their group, then for their wing, then for and most of them, they don't, some compete at the number of the Air Force, and then for their MAGCOM, then they competed against all the other MAGCOM winners. So, I mean, they, they went through uh, a lot of levels of competition to literally uh, get to this point, and then I'll allow them to finish telling you what, what they did. 
I, oh, thank you for uh, you know, calling me out. Appreciate it. <laughs> so, you're, so, yes, um, to be honest, yes, I get this, asked this question a lot, and specifically because out of everyone here, um, I've had the shortest time in service. I'm approaching four years uh, coming this October. And simple answer I've, ever, I've always given is I've just always strived to be the teammate that I'd want to go to war with. Like, as far as, um, as, far as like, going to work was, and Captain Jorgensen over there can attest to this, I just cared more about the person next to me. Like, we get, you know, go to field exercises, and then we'll just do a lot of taskings that are, that are very challenging. But my focus is always on, you know, what can I do to make my, my buddy, my, team, my teammates bloat easier? And then just volunteer to help out around the squadron, volunteer for teaching CPR and self-aid buddy care just so we could um, up our readiness. Um, a challenge, a, a opportunity came down to go to aerosol school, so I volunteered for that. And then things just kind of took a, took a roll from there. I actually didn't even know what OAY was either until, until like just a year ago, to be honest. So this wasn't an award that I was actually set my sights on and then decided to go and, sh to go and try to achieve. Um, biggest thing I would just say, find satisfaction in knowing that you're making a difference. I come from a biology background, so with computers it's a little different, but you know, if, you, if you understand that you know, the people around you are like the atoms that make up everything, they have, a they have a specific purpose, and everyone, has, everyone is valuable and useful. So that's what I would say. I'm going off of that, too. I think it's really, truly just about adding value. I can tell you from you know, getting to know all of these 11 uh, other outstanding airmen, they've added tremendous value to their units, to their work centers, to their airmen. Um, you know, I have a psychology background, so electronic signals anal analysis is more, it's basically engineering for radars. Uh, it's not something I would have ever thought I could do, but I worked really hard at it. My mentors pushed me into other avenues as well. Um, just figure out what you're good at, challenge yourself at what you're not good at, um, but just figure out where you can add value, and I think that'll really set you up well. Um, I would like to add something else on that. It's very similar to your answer when you went uh, s several years ago, and, and congrats, and thank you for coming out here today. Uh, okay. We're excited that you're here, too. Um, so, so very much like um, your answer, and, and I think some, most of us uh, kind of say the same thing. You know, there's not a direct path to get to the outstanding airman of the year. Um, there are a lot of contributing factors, timing, supervisor, leadership, uh, teamwork. A lot of people put in a lot of efforts to put our package together to um, advocate for us, to speak about on behalf of us in front of MASHCOM, number Air Force at the wing level, whatever, that le uh, whatever path that got us to this stage. Uh, but something else I think is very important is um, uh, I think timing. I, I, I think I believe everything happened for a reason. Um, I believe opportunities comes and go. Um, you always have to be ready. You, you have to be the best of the best. You have to be ready when you get out of bed. You have to be ready when you go to work. Because sometimes that opportunity just show up and it just goes away. Uh, you have to be ready to perform, to act, uh, to provide that leadership or that mentorship. So I think. Uh, has a lot to do with we're all fantastic people, we all did our job really well, but uh, the opportunities that came, and fortunately for us, it came to us, and we were able to grab onto it and do the best we can and to represent uh, our MATCHCOM and, and the Air Force. I always say going last because everybody gives really good answers. Um, but. Just to piggyback off what everybody else said, yes, right place, right time, a little bit of luck, mentorship, all of that stuff's incredibly important. But for me personally, um, it was passion. You know, if you take a look at my 1206, about three or the four of the bullets in the whole, uh, the whole airman concept section are what I am truly passionate about. And that's where that intrinsic motivation comes from. So you find that passion, you find what you really truly care about and love, and you attack it with everything that you have, you can't help but have a couple of really strong bullets because you're changing the Air Force with what you're doing and you're having a good time doing it too. Yes, I'm good at my job, um, but is that, 
the exact reason why I'm here? Absolutely not. You look at me from a more holistic aspect and you see this is the guy that's dedicating thousands of hours outside of the Air Force to help others in this specific capacity um, because I'm passionate about that, because I, I genuinely care and love about the, uh, the health and wellness of other people too. So you'll find that with all 12 of us too if you get that opportunity to speak with us all too. And I'll be honest with you, sir, I still have that song stuck in my head, Friends in Low Places, so yeah. that was great, thank you. <laughs> All seen. right, ma'am. Phenomenal question. I really like that one. Here we go. <laughs> um, personally, in, in my unit, right, so I, uh, I, that is my span of control, or my boom operators, um, revitalizing the squadrons, as uh, General Goldstein mentions. My commander does a phenomenal job with that and, you know, helping the morale to grow. Um, we're flyers, we're in and out. I don't get to see my people every day on a daily basis, but what I tell you that I do is that I make it my mission to know everything and anything about all the people that I supervise. I um, mean, and, and it is not, it's not about just work. I know their wife's name, I know their kids' names, I know their birthdays, I call them. It's just little things that I do. I call them on their birthday, I send them to whatever, whatever it takes for my airman to feel like he belongs to something greater than themselves. And that is my passion, passion is people purpose you know that is my purpose is as i make sure that they feel welcome that when they come to that squadron it's like they're at home um and and that's one of the little things that i that i do hey while while josh contemplates his uh question i'd be remiss if i didn't talk about <clears throat> one of as, as you see we only have 10 um uh, winners here today uh one of them is not here her name is tech sergeant april spildy uh, she was a defender. Uh, she's retraining into equal opportunity, and she's in training right now. That's why she couldn't be here today. So, so I'd like to attack this question in stages, right? So at my immediate flight level, um, within my span of control, f food is, is my language, right? And so um, how many of you guys, food is your language, right? I'm high context, high context culture is food, right? So we sit down, we, we eat. Um, and so within my flight, uh, once a month, we, we do some sort of potluck, um, and it doesn't matter if it's in the unit or outside of the unit. Um, in the Matias household, one of our boundaries, um, I don't interact with, uh, with spouses. So my wife comes along, and for our deployed airmen, she's staying in contact with the spouses that are still in the local area to create that bridge there. At the squadron level, um, I'm having the tough conversations with the senior NCOs about how do we get our airmen to positions where we can intentionally develop them, right? Innovation is a big push right now. But what does innovation mean if, you don't, if you're afraid to fail, right? And so the, the, the awesomeness about AFMC is we love to fail so we can get better. And so within the unit, we're not just looking for, for small TDYs where we can go to Disney uh, executive conference. No, we're, we're pushing our airmen towards cer certifications. If the unit's going to pay for it, get a certification so it helps both within the Air Force and outside of the Air Force. At the group level, um, what we're getting after to help our airmen is our bullet structure. How do we tell the story? Connecting everything back to the five Air Force priorities, which connect back to the national defense strategy, right? And so trying to take care of our airmen from that perspective. From the wing level, what, we're, what I'm trying to do to help is, is getting involved with the, with the first four, right? So as an OAY, it'd be simple to sit on the outside and say, hey, I'm here. But the first thing Chief challenged us to do in DC was don't let this be the pinnacle of our, of our career, right? And so getting back to the first four saying, hey, how can I help you guys? And then trying to create spaces where our airmen feel connected, not just within the unit or, or the squadron, but more so the wing, and then finally, giving back to the community, creating spaces for, so, so I can serve alongside my airmen, our airmen across the wing, out in the local community, so we can tell the Air Force story, because we're ambassadors for the Air Force. And so really it is that, that connectedness and that feeling like a family, like Sergeant Stockett said, um, because inherently the, the core values tie us together, but because we're airmen, 
we, we have a bond that no matter where we go, we can show up at your doorstep and somebody's going to take you in. And so continuing that culture. Um, so that definitely is a really complicated, complex, diverse issue, right? Your, the culture of your organization. And it can seem really overwhelming. I myself, I'm just, you know, I'm a frontline supervisor. And for you cadets, you're going to be um, that brand new lieutenant. So I think you could also just start small. Uh, lead by example. You know, you, you, at the end of the day, control your, your own self. Right? You can't always control what's going on, you know, outside of you. But if you take a moment, you know, uh, every day con commit to leading by example, then um, that's a good way to start. Do we have any questions from the back? Anybody from the back? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> <laughs> so, uh, everybody's familiar with Myrtle Beach, right? Anybody know? Yeah, so there's an aquarium there. Um, I was with my niece and nephew, uh, and we were at the little place where you like pet the, I don't know, like shell crabs or whatever they're called. It doesn't really matter. It's not important. So I get a, uh, <laughs> I get a call uh, from, my, uh, from my commander. Uh, he was a little weird. Uh, he is not weird. The, the conversation was weird. It was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm killing it, and uh, and um, and yeah, he was just asking me all these uh, questions, like how was how was I doing today? How's the weather there? It was it was just it was awkward. And then I hung up, and then five minutes later, I get a call from my uh, my wing commander, and he congratulated me over the phone, apologized for not being able to do it in person. Um, after I hung up the phone, I got super excited, started yelling and screaming. I had to apologize to a second grade field trip that was in the middle of the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the aquarium. I, I walked outside and called my uh, called a couple of mentors. One of them was the uh, individual who won last year and who was one of my uh, my big fans too. And uh, yeah, that was a moment that I'm never really gonna forget. Um, so I just very much like Dave. Uh, I was super excited when I found out. Um, at the time, I was uh, with the Reserve Command TDY to Lake and Heath Air Force Base, uh, where David um, uh, Simon Miller is. Um, I was out doing some survey with my, with my team, uh, doing some field survey using uh, GIS equipment. Um, when, I, when I found out that day, I was, I was speechless. I, was, I did not think about that, uh, never thought about in the support world that I, I had the capability, I had the opportunity to reach that level. But it's true, the opportunity is there. And uh, I was just super excited and, and, and I was speechless. And, uh, we had a great time with my unit. Uh, we, we, went, we went out and celebrated. So I, uh, I was at my first form of PME. I was at, we call it Airman Leadership School or ALS. And I was my four weeks in, so I, was, I had just a week, maybe a week and a half left before graduation. And my supervisor, he had showed up and he was in his dress blues and he's like, hey, he's like, are you ready? And I'm like, ready for what? And he's like, we have this PowerPoint we have to give to the base commander on what ALS is about and what graduation is like, because he had just taken over as the new wing commander. And I was, I was freaking out. We had, we had just finished doing our blues inspection for, <clears throat> for the day. And so I, I, I had no idea what was happening. And then my commander showed up, and he's like, all right, let's go. We have to go now. We've got to be there in five minutes. And so on the way there, he gave me his laptop with this the, the worst PowerPoint I've ever seen in my life. They literally just made it. And he, I, he's like, you need to review these slides and go through everything, and we're, we're driving over, and it was just a five minute drive from well, where ALS was to our commander's uh, headquarters. And we get there, and I had every five slides, like just, I had it down to the T. I was ready, we got inside, met the wing commander, and then um, we hooked the laptop up, and I started giving this PowerPoint and the entire time he was just staring at me and I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm blowing it. Like I'm, I was stumbling over my words, I was sweating, it was bad. And then at the end of it, he's like, so why am I getting this PowerPoint? Like he had no idea why the PowerPoint was, he, he was just like gonna tell me congratulations. And uh, my supervisor, my commander just started laughing at me. And that's when I realized, I was like, all right, something's going on. And he's like, you know, I'm just, congratulations on making 12 outstanding over the year. And, so I, I sat there, I cried, my supervisor cried. It was, it was a bad time, but uh, so that was my experience. That was the moment I found out, so. Vulnerability. Uh, 
Dr. Brown. I want to I want to share how important uh, this award is because I will tell you that as excited as we were all, I think your supervisors, your commander, your command chief, they are more excited than than us. And this award is so important that when I found out I was having surgery, and they called me to come into a meeting after surgery. They didn't know I was having surgery. And they said, Sergeant Stockett, where are you? I was like, uh, well, I was a little high off of some good, good stuff. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm getting dressed. They're like, oh, we need you in this meeting uh, in like an hour. And I was like, uh, this is my command chief. So I said, yes, sir, I'll be there. And uh, my driver was like, do they know you just had surgery? I was like, doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's go get my flight suit. <laughs> So I went home, uh, I had a liver biopsy, by the way, so my whole part of my middle section was in pain. And uh, I get in my flight suit, and I get over there, he's like, what do they need you for? I said, I, I, said, I don't know, but he sounded like it was really important. Um, so we get there, and it's like a whole conference room full of people. They actually were having an official meeting, I, just, I guess I just crashed the meeting. And, uh, um, they were what I what I now know is that they were going to do a conference call in to let me know that I won the award, and uh, man, an hour into this meeting, I'm sitting in the back like I'm in pain, I'm I'm kind of loopy and stuff, and then they get a like they get a phone call, and you know, um, the commander answers it, and um, you know, hi everybody, this is you know our, our IMC commander, and uh, we just like to randomly call into meetings to uh, see how you guys are doing, and everybody's just looking around like, oh, that's weird, and I'm in the back just like almost asleep, right, passing out. <laughs> I think I was bleeding out, but I don't know, and uh, and finally they're like, well, we would like to ask a question to uh, to the members of your audience, kind of like a like a show, right, like come on down. And uh, my uh, commander looks behind me, he's like, yeah, well, hold on, I think I have somebody that, uh, that would be able to answer your question. And so he's sitting forward and I'm sitting in the back and he does this and I'm like dodging him, right? <laughs> like, like, please don't pick me because <laughs> I'm a little loopy. And he's like, actually, uh, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Stock, you know, uh, she, she's gonna answer your question. And everybody looks at me and I'm just like, oh, here I go, you know? We'll see how this turns out. Um, <laughs> So he asks the question, and I, and I just give the best answer. I don't remember, because like I said, I was a little high. And, uh, and so he was like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, good, uh, that's a good question, Sergeant Stockett, uh, that, that you asked me. But uh, so I have one for you. Uh, what are you going to be doing the next year? And of course, I give the great Air Force answer. I don't know, sir, taking care of my airmen to the best of my ability. <laughs> uh, and he's like, well, how about being in one of the 12 outstanding airmen of the year? Right? And everybody starts clapping and cheering. And it still doesn't hit me because I'm still a little high. My, my, my center hurts. And then I just start crying. I can't control it. And I think it's the meds, right? Let's blame it on the meds. <laughs> and they're all cheering and stuff. And I'm just like crying and sobbing. But my center section started hurting. So I was crying more because of that, right? <laughs> and everybody's just like, you can't stop crying. I was like, I know, I'm just in pain. <laughs> But anyways, this is how important it is that they'll call you out of surgery to tell you that you won a 12 OAY. All right. Yes, ma'am, you right here on the end. Chief Wright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> chief Wright, right? I think all of us have been in uh, long enough to have numerous Chief Master Sergeants of the Air Force. Um, and, and you'll hear the same thing every time. You go to the one that everybody else is going to. Um, initially, when you show up on an installation, you're going to think, wow, this is, this is overwhelming. There are a lot of people in my tier group. How do I stand out? And typically, there'll be four or five. Essentially, one in every group, two in every group has been my experience. 
Look around to see who, who's involved, who's crushing their job, who's saying what about what. And typically the wing command chief can point you in the right direction because they by name request people for certain projects because they're entrusted with that. And so that's kind of how I go about trying to seek out the, the best mentors. Um, and realistically speaking, having PCS seven times in 15 years um, and deployed five in that period, um, you're only gonna have a handful of people that move with you from assignment to assignment. And so you wanna be very, very selective. Um, but you wanna go somewhere, right? And so I need to be challenged myself. I'm looking for somebody who's gonna challenge me to go further than where I am right now, who can teach me things that are different than right now. And so as a lieutenant or a young airman who's showing up, you can easily fall into the crowd of the, this is the status quo, this is how it goes or you can challenge yourself to become better. And so typically, if you, if you look around, it's not hard to find the airman at any level who, who truly is standing out and can help get you to the right place. So um, one of the good ways you can really see who, uh, who a good senior CEO is, uh, watch your airman. For instance, you know, you always see a good senior CEO, there are also airmen coming to them. Like in my shop, my supervisor, like any time I walk back into the shop, I always see someone's in his office talking to him. He's turned off, he's put, uh, turned off his computer screen, put his phone down, he's listening and talking to him directly. Uh, in chief, you'll see they'll have like a flow of airmen coming in now, and it's not coming in out for punishment. You'll see them coming out. They come to him because they have a problem they have to get off their chest. They come to him because they want to talk about their family. Those kind of senior CEOs are the ones that always have like a constant flow of airmen going in and out of their office. And then you also see there are some where no one wants to go to them. No one, no one relies on them, no one trusts them. And that's kind of the big dividing line is where do your airmen go? Where does the river flow? And that's how you know where to go to find your good guidance, good leadership. Wow, that's great advice. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. a good question. So my personal experience, uh, doing the right thing isn't always the easiest, but you'll find that while you might be afraid to know, be a part, separate from the crowd, make that decision to stay your route. Also, they'll follow you along the way. For instance, let's say, for me, I do cable installation. So we install cable. Um, one of the guys I was working with, he was saying, just plug it in. Doesn't matter how it looks, just get, just get it up there and make it work. But the way I was brought up in my training is that the way it looks is the way you're going to be perceived. Doesn't matter how anything that came before you looks, it's what the work you put in is what's going to be reflected. And I went ahead, continued to do it my way, stopped what he was doing, showed him the right way to do it. And afterwards, he kind of came back up to me and was like, you know what, you're kind of right. Doing it the right way does make it look better, does have a different impact on it. Uh, Leadership come down, they always say, you know, I've seen some of the other products, the way y'all do it looks amazing. And it's that kind of thing where the attitude you take, no matter whether they're higher rank, lower rank, if you hold yourself to a higher standard, they'll fall suit. So uh, I want to add something else to that uh, uh, as, as far as how to lead your peers. Uh, um, you, can be a lead, you can be a leader in many different forms and many different ways. But that's something else I want, want you guys to also think about is um, you might not be the subject matter expert in every single task that comes out. Be flexible, uh, be willing to step back and allow your peers to lead on certain items that, uh, that they might be more knowledge on. Uh, the ability to be flexible. Uh, be flexible to lead your peers and be flexible to step back to allow your peers to lead you. Uh, I think that is important to know your strength and your weaknesses and to know your peers' strength and weaknesses uh, to perform the best of everyone's ability. All right, sir. Original 
All right, quick from Chief McGee, Deox. I got a stat from the Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> Tech Sergeant McGowan from the USAFA Equal Opportunity Office. Congratulations to all of you for being here. All right, what is the Deox? The Deox is an anonymous survey that gives you a chance to tell your leaders what's really going on, what you want to see, and where they can improve. It's your best forum to, to give them your honest and open opinion and allow us to make the changes and rile the changes up to where they need to be. Okay. Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute um, climate survey. So it's a, a survey on the human relation climate and um, how the people feel. Good job. Good job. All right. Okay. All right, Brett, you want to talk about uh, any original mistakes? Uh, yeah, so uh, being, a, being a gunship guy for the last uh, seven years, uh, a lot of you might be familiar with like the, the Kunduz incident. Uh, where there was uh, unfortunately civilians killed uh, because uh, not only us, but other uh, platforms uh, dropped munitions on a hospital. And uh, that was a huge learning curve for us. Um, and uh, we always talk about, you know, air crew world breaking that air chain and, and, and things like that. And so for us, it was a huge learning experience because it's, it's been years and years since our last incident like that. And uh, so a huge mistake on, on our part, the, the the JTAX part uh, calling in the wrong coordinates, us for confirming the wrong coordinates. Um, but we took those mistakes and we learned from it. And uh, you just you just got to put it in the past. Uh, you learn from it and you move forward uh, due to the best of your ability to never repeat mistakes like that because obviously we're not in the business of killing civilians or, or innocent people, but it is war. It's going to happen. Mistakes are going to be made, but you have to limit those mistakes. And that's something that we obviously want to limit to the best of our ability. Um, put a huge stain on, on our squadron for a long time, and uh, we're still, you know, for some, somewhat recovering from it. But you have to put it in the past, you have to learn from it, and you have to move forward. Um, uh, it's, making mistakes is, is going to make who you are as a person. I know I've made plenty in my career, um, but you learn from it. You know, my very first deployment, I missed a checklist step. I end up leaving a puzzle seal in the 25 millimeter and end up shooting it out. Did the gun still work that day? Yeah, it did. But uh, I now know, I mean, that's just one thing that I'll never forget. You know, I made that mistake and I learned from it. And it's just one of those things. You, you just have to put it in the past and, and keep, put, keep putting that foot in, for the, in front of the other one and, and moving on. So for me, an original mistake is uh, I was unteachable. Staff Sergeant, Tech Sergeant Matias, I was unteachable. And I missed out on a lot of opportunities to grow. My, my senior leaders didn't have trust and confidence in me to place me in positions where I could sit on the wall and just watch. I was a rule follower, which there's nothing wrong with, and I could give you the right answer, but sometimes the right answer isn't the best answer. And so I was unteachable, and I missed a lot of key developmental opportunities where now I turn to my airmen and, and I try to teach them to be teachable. Um, and I think we've heard that throughout the theme of, of, of being here at NCLS and as we continue to grow as leaders, is you, you have to be teachable. Do, do I want to continue to portray this image like my glass is full? What can I do if your glass is full? I need, I need a glass for myself that's half full so I can continue to learn so that way I'm better prepared when I show up. For instance, um, my very first opportunity to be a flight chief was in a deployed location with zero assistant training. And so I relied a lot on the rules and mentors to help get me through and asking questions, right? And because I was unteachable, I didn't have a core group of mentors who could work me through certain problems. But as I've grown, as I've, I've, as I've matured, I've realized that no decision that I make as a, as a facility chief, as a leader, is my own decision. I have to seek counsel first from others and then ultimately I have to make a decision that's for the betterment of the institution as the Air Force and then the betterment of the Airmen. And, and a lot of that comes through learning over the years that I was unteachable and deciding within myself moving forward that I want to be teachable so people can invest in me. 
Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Jeff Ward, class to Justin Yates. And when you think of the people that you respect the most, whether that be a leader, a peer, or someone you don't necessarily like, what quality stands out the most? So, oh, John. Yeah, please. I'll let you go first. Go ahead. I was just going to say resiliency. You know, um, the idea, and life's hard. This job is even harder. Um, the things that we do, the things that we're asked to do, uh, they take a toll on us. And uh, the thing that I respect most about everybody, what I, whether it be a leader, whether it be an individual who maybe I disagree with, so on and so forth, what I see in them, their ability to bounce back through that toughness, through that hardship, is one of the most invaluable things, I think. Not just within the Air Force, but you as a, a human being. Uh, you as a uh, sibling, uh, as a father, uh, as a mentor, coach, whatever you're going to have, that ability to bounce back and that ability to teach resiliency uh, is, is just invaluable. Um, for myself, I would have to say the trait or characteristic I look for in a leader would be humility. And simply being put is, you know, having that, uh, having that attitude or the mindset to be at a certain level of understanding and then trying to come at it from uh, someone else's perspective, understand where they maybe, they maybe are missing the concept, and then putting in the best way to articulate it so that they can understand it. A lot of times, you know, we fall into that whole thing of, well, if somebody's not getting, if, if somebody doesn't understand it, then that's their failure. They're just, they're either not trying to be smart at, I'm sorry. sorry. It's either they're not trying to be, they're, maybe they're not, they're not working on trying to be, uh, better themselves academically, or whether they, they maybe just have some shortcomings, but, a lot of times, the best leaders that I've uh, encountered always try to take it to a point where they look at the, they look at the issue and then they, they try to understand the individual and how they learn best, and then they try to come at it from an angle that best suits them. For <laughs> so for me, it's uh, micromanaging. In my fields, like it's very hard, almost impossible for us to have a successful project if you're a micromanager, because you, as a team chief or as the uh, the, NC, uh, the officer in charge, you have way too much as you have to see big picture. You have logistics, you have manpower, you have ordering lime uh, materials, and that is something that if you're a micromanager and trying to be nitpicking every little area, you're going to miss something or your team's not going to be able to perform at the high, their highest performance because you're keeping your leaders, your NCOs, people you've put in charge, keeping them from being able to work and actually take charge in the way they're supposed to and actually control their team. Something I want to add on there is uh, not to be afraid to get dirty. Um, we expect our airmen, whether you are a maintainer, civil engineering, defender, we expect our airmen to go out there, do a lot of hard work, sweat, and tear out the um, But to forget, as a, you know, a new officer, go out there to learn about their career field, to learn about the job. Uh, for CG specific, we have a multiple All right, we have time for one more question, and then we'll have our panel members uh, give us some final thoughts. <coughs> Sir. The, uh, the weight of the award is a, is a huge driver. Uh, I, I can't speak for the other 11 of us, but I think I, uh, I, can, I can definitely speak for myself on this. Um, the fact that the award is bigger than one person and what it represents and what you can do with it, um, the power that comes with it, the ability to help others um, within the Air Force through uh, your actions, through your words, that sort of thing, is something that's never 
it's never happened to me in the past and it's probably never going to happen to me again on this scale. Um, so utilizing that as, as a driving force uh, to improve myself every single day and be better than I was yesterday, uh, you find that when you have that fire and you have that type of responsibility, uh, complacency is not even an issue, at least for me. <laughs> a little mic dance. So uh, one of our mentors when we were out in D.C., Sergeant Stevens, uh, one of the things he said to us is, you know, keep that foot on the gas pedal. And uh, for me, uh, you know, as Sergeant Miller said too, it's not just a one-person effort. Uh, it's a team effort. Uh, I know for me, uh, I, I feel like I've been on the road since last May, uh, going, 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 and, and it's not let up, and it's not going to let up uh, anytime soon. Uh, did all the awards, did that. I got back, started flying again local lines, TDYs, uh, doing jaded thunders, you know, joint, joint exercises with the, the who's who of ground, ground teams. And uh, you get out, you're training, you know, I'm passing on, you know, my skills because I'm not going to be doing this forever to my younger guys so they can take over and, and hopefully fill that role that I'm going to be soon leaving. So it's just, you know, passing that on to, to the younger airmen and, and showing them, hey, these are the ropes, man. This is what you got to do if you want to be at this level, compete at this level. Um, but don't forget about the guy behind you, you know, because they're coming up right behind you as well. So for me, it's just, you know, again, what Sergeant Stevens said, passed on, just keeping that, that foot on the gas pedal and, and not letting up. Uh, TDYs, again, here, you know, I mean, I just got back from a six-week tail swap. I didn't even think I was going to make it out here. <laughs> and then uh, weather canceled me two days from getting here. So uh, you yeah. just keep pushing forward and, and keeping that foot down on the gas pedal. And All right, we're going to give uh, this gentleman, he raised his hand a couple of times. So. Hey, Sorry to be the extra question fairly, but uh, uh, Cadet 3rd Class Falco from Cadet Squadron 19. And uh, a lot of you guys talked about how what made you successful is like knowing what you're contributing to and being intrinsically motivated and stuff like that. And some background to my question is I was a C-17 maintainer before coming here, but I was a home station check. So we'd have planes come in on Monday, they'd go out Tuesday, we'd have another, we'd never see the mission. And it kind of festered a... Uh, low morale, a lot of cynicism. So as like direct supervisors, flight chief, superintendent, and for uh, new lieutenants come in, what could you like say is the best thing to do to like help keep the energy and motivation for all the airmen to have those, even though it's a very important like cog in the system, how do you keep them and know to know that they are such an important part of that mission? In my job, or I should say my, the job that promoted me out of the position as flight chief of the DGS-1 analysis and reporting team at Langley. Um, my airmen were taking the fight to ISIS every day. So sometimes we had to go above and beyond and reach out to organizations downrange to see what their effects were. Um, when we were writing the packages for the airmen, you know, it was, okay, we did X amount of predator operations and hours, well, what was the end result? So sometimes you have to go above and beyond to figure out what the whole cycle is and, and what, what con contributions you are actually doing in the end game. So um, I just got back from my deployment about three weeks ago. And um, one of the things that they did in the theater was when they was, after, at the end of the month, they would take back any footage, any combat footage from that, that they could share and they would show it to the troops who, uh, who had worked in that, uh, the kingpin. And what they would do is, by showing them that footage, it would uh, keep them motivated because they saw what their actions, what their decisions had made and the impact it made in the end run. So that kept them motivated. And for us, uh, we, we were relocating a tower, and they showed us what that tower was feeding them, what information it was giving. And that kind of, that re-motivated my team to get back out there and to work harder in getting that project finished. All right. So let's end with uh, we'll have each one of the panel members provide us with some closing comments. All right. In closing, um, I think one last piece of advice I have would be just to look out for emotional intelligence. Uh, if you I work in Intel, uh, we have a, an incredible amount of really in, uh, smart people. Uh, they don't always know how to work with people well. Um, so for myself, uh, taking an interest in psychology and really developing those skills in myself, it's made a world of difference in how I can relate to my peers, how I can mentor um, airmen below me, and also how I can uh, reach out to my mentors above me. 
Um, so if that's something you're lacking in or something you are really good at, uh, please feel free to share that with others because it'll make you a better leader. Um, just in closing, I just wanted to say that I, I, I'm a prime example of what uh, resiliency can handle. Um, my story uh, mirrors uh, the Chiefs a little bit uh, in the beginning of our careers, whereas I wasn't the best airman. I didn't listen to the people I needed to listen to. I thought I had everything figured out. I was a little bit older than everybody, still am. Um, but uh, I'm one of those uh, textbook definitions of a, of a late bloomer. So do not give up on those individuals that are a little bit rough, uh, that you see potential in. Help them to grow. Help them to understand the importance of what they do, who they are. Help them to find themselves. Um, that is the act of a true leader. It's going to take a lot of patience, at least it did with me. Um, but it pays off uh, at the end. When I have that ability to send an email to the mentor that gave me that chance, that gave me, I try to say Sean Chance at the same time, uh, that gave me that chance uh, to stay in the military, uh, that said directly, I don't trust you at this particular moment, you have to earn that trust back. Uh, getting that opportunity to send him an email after I was named one of the 12 OAY to thank him personally uh, for the decision that changed not only my career but my life. Um, is one of the most important and meaningful experiences of my life. And you guys will have that opportunity uh, within your time as leaders. I guarantee it. So don't give up. Don't give up on them. Mine would be uh, don't stifle innovation. Uh, if your airman comes to you with a new idea, don't just tell them that we can't do that because the AFI says not to. If you look at AFIs, they've been rewritten about like every three months. So there's always, there's always a chance to improve and always give them the opportunity if you, someone can't do something, give them a real reason why they can't, but I always encourage it. Uh, in closing, I, one last piece of advice would be <clears throat> be open, like we had talked about earlier, to new ideas. A uh, prime example is we had had a, a new captain come straight from the schoolhouse. Uh, he was taken over as our flight commander, and we were out on the range doing clearance. And he had no idea what we were doing, and he let us know. He's like, I don't, I don't have any idea what's going on. He's like... I, I know how to do basic demolition operations, everything else, and we're like, great. So we went ahead, and as a senior airman, I was telling the captain exactly what needed to be done, how to fill these certain roles, and he was completely open to the ideas, and he knew that you know safety was a huge concern, so he was totally receptive to everything. And if, it, if he didn't have that open mindset, and he wasn't open to those ideas, and hearing feedback from not only you know the senior NCOs there, but also the airmen that are there that have been there for years and know exactly what's going on, you know, it, the operation could have went completely differently. So that's just uh, an example from my case, but it, it's, it's broad. Like, be receptive, be open, listen to your airmen, and, you know, that, that feedback will go a long way. They'll notice that you're listening, and then your airmen will trust you more in the end. First and foremost, thanks for being here and uh, listening to us. Uh, take care of yourselves. Take care of your people. Be transparent. Allow yourself to fail and take some risks. Everything else falls in place. You have to have trust. You have to have trust in your airmen. For me, my leadership trusted me. Even when I made mistakes as the flight chief, they knew that I was gonna take care of the airmen. Ultimately, it's a team effort. My award and being up here is not solely mine. My 134 airmen are truly the ones that deserve the award. And if I could give it to them, I would. Um, they trusted me, my airmen trusted me. I trusted them to make decisions when they were working the 24-hour operations. As Staff Sergeant Senior Airman running the section, in the absence of senior NCOs and NCOs that could do the job with them. So you have to trust, you have to have faith, you have to have credibility. You have to be willing to work hard and be dedicated to the mission. Thank you. Um, so what I would say, uh, uh, my last thing I would add is uh, be ready. Be ready for the opportunities that might be available out there. Um, be flexible. Um, trust your peers. Trust your wingman. Count on them. Rely on them. Help each other out so you can succeed as a team. Watch a lot of movies, read a lot of books. Just kidding. Um, so I have three things written on my wall in my office. The first one is know who you are. Know who you are, which means know where you come from and know where you're trying to get. 
Number two is understand what you value. Above our core values, what do you value? What family values have you, have you earned along the ways? What, uh, what core values, what drives you? And then number three, what's your purpose in life? If you can connect with your purpose in life, you'll begin to be passionate about different things which will lead you to different areas. So those are the three things I leave you with. Know who you are, know what you value, and know what your purpose is. All right, thank you guys for uh, coming out and listening to us again. Um, kind of what um, Sergeant Stockett hit on, you know, take care of yourself. Uh, you guys, some of you are going to go out there and you're going to fly the latest and greatest uh, fighter aircraft and you're going to do some amazing things. Um, and it may end up catching up to you guys. Uh, I know that from personal experience. But know it's okay to ask for help. Don't let that stigma of, like, it's going to ruin my career uh, stop you from going and asking for help. Uh, it didn't me. Uh, I turned it around and uh, got myself on track again. So it's okay to ask for help and, and don't think that it's not. Always take care of yourself and always take care of your airmen. Well, after all that wisdom, uh, I guess I'll close off with saying, find a reason to just smile and be grateful every day. It goes a long way. And thank you very much, all of you, for having us out here. I can say from all of us, we're, we're eternally grateful. All right.